Are we turned on like here? That's probably not on. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, y'all look so beautiful out there this morning. Uh, uh, you got a you got a real compliment anyway, and I, I'll not say that for the worship service. But you guys look beautiful. Uh, probably I might as well get this off my chest. It's uh, uh, the PET scan come back positive for cancer cells, so I'm going to have to have a opened up in the chest, I guess, and get a a chunk of a biopsy for them to know what kind of cancer it is and uh, well, how to treat it. But uh, last week I was praising the Lord and glorious, thinking that everything was going to be all right, you know, but you don't know what tomorrow holds. Right, right, but we know who holds it. And I thought, uh, I thought, uh, Now's the time to really praise him and thank him for all he does. Uh, a little funny here, Judy gave me, it says, which way the wind blows? Uh, we never know which way the wind's going to blow. But a famous preacher, C.J. Surgeon, told the story of a pastor who was out for a walk in the countryside when he stopped by a farmhouse for a drink of water. As he sipped down his glass, set down, he sipped down from his glass, he struck up a conversation with the old family, family who lived there. As they spoke, the pastor noticed that the farmer's barn had a weather vane on it that was spinning around in the wind, which was picking up. On the weather vane, the words, God is love, were engraved. The pastor turned to the farmer and said, I have to say, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's a very good way to talk about God's love. Are you saying his love is wishy-washy and changes depending on which way the wind blows? Not at all, replied the farmer. The weather vane is saying no matter which way the wind blows, God is love. So God loves us this morning, don't he? Uh, I'm going to read two verses of scripture in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. As you have Therefore receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk you in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's just thankful that uh, God gave us breath to get up this morning, uh, put our shoes on. Uh, peace and pain. Not far, not far from our home in North Carolina is Mount Mitchell, the highest point in the eastern, uh, eastern United States. On its ridge are all are old trees that have been stunned and and girded by the hostile climate and the spray rocky soil. But local craftsmen have told me that if one of these trees finally dies, he would. His wood is highly prized, and the ransom is because it's so strong. The tree resists those fierce alpine winds for decades, and they are strengthened in it. What happens when the wind of adversity blows in our life? Do they uh, flatten you, knock you down, stop on your growth, or like those trees, do your growth stronger? What makes the difference? The trees that survive. I am told that those that with the deepest roots, the roots are like a anchor, helping them to survive the shame, and they don't uh, and they don't draw up the soil, helping them to grow stronger. Make sure your soul is firmly planted in Christ, as you may be rooted and built up in Him and established in His faith. And that's Colossians verses two seven. <coughs> the bulletin has no anniversaries or uh, birthdays, but we're going to sing happy birthday to a girl that wasn't here last week. Did 
Does she know who it is? <laughs> Miss Betty. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Brother Larry, Jay Young, will you stand and open our Sunday school up as a word of prayer? Let's all stand in with Larry and we'll do our pledges. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. To the Christian flag, I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. To our American flag this morning, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Has anybody got anything they want to add to the service yet this morning before we go to Sunday school? Any announcements or anything? You have got announcements on your bulletin, of course. Uh, this is uh, rest home service today at 2.30. Uh, I'm sure those people down there will really appreciate you if you wish to show up. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen teachers may take their classes
less, and you know, because if you publish these names after so many years, you've got to come back to the same thing. Right? I mean, there's four quarters in a year. You've got to produce one of these every three months and on different things. And I don't know exactly when the last time that the, they actually had the book of Luke in uh, the text, but probably a good definition or a good uh, uh, of uh, title to me from what I gather of the last one today should have been really the introduction of the forerunner. And, and I realize it's uh, when they under, I understand what they're trying to say to God's intervention because we've got to realize that, that number one, for 400 years up until we come to this scripture from the book of Malachi and here, it is 400 years of what's called in biblical terms as the dark ages when uh, God didn't speak to nobody. There was no open vision. There was no prophets in the land. And uh, I've been studying this week uh, in the book of Ezra. And again, I, I told you Wednesday that I just finished up First and Second Kings and then I skipped the Chronicles because again, they're, they're pretty well the same thing. Not something I have to study before, but I wanted to go on into to Ezra because and what, at the end of uh, the Kings is the carrying away in the book of Ezra is the return. And I talked to you Wednesday night, I, I believe it was, I mentioned about how one of the kings, uh, uh, Josiah, they found the book of the law and they brought it out and found all the things that, that God was going to do, how he was going to punish the nation of Israel for their sins, and then they would begin to repent and to, to turn back to God, but it was too late. They were carried away. Ezra, we find the return. And when they got back, how fast they begin to fall back into idolatry absolutely just blows my mind. With everything that they went had went through. And God really, I mean, gives up. You feel that like it, you know, it's not that God gave up on society or on mankind because Remember, Christ was the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world, but it seems like that the nation of Israel is just hopeless. And they're turned over, and they're really not a nation. From the book of Malachi, when they fall away there again, and they come in and the Romans take over, from that period of time, all the way up until 1948, they were out of existence and scattered abroad and not a nation for close to 2,000, well, uh, close to 2,400 years. And that, you know, that's, to me, that's just a, amazing. Uh, the thing is, though, you, you're thinking that 2,400 years, and I realize I haven't touched anything yet on our lesson, but in that 2,400 year period, it looks like they're forgotten. But then in that 2400 period, year period, here comes Christ. And then there's the, uh, again, 2000, almost 2000 years after he comes before they finally become a nation or a people again, not wandering. And since then, people are still pouring back into the nation of Israel. It, it, it has the fastest growing, the strongest economy of any nation in the world right now. It is the fastest growing. Alright. Key verse is actually the first verse out of our lesson. It said, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Now, Lesson objectives is to see how God broke human into human history to 
to rejoice in the unmerited favor of God and to be all by what God can do. Now, again, it's not covered in our lesson, but I think we have to look at the fact about Zechariah and Elizabeth. Number one, he was a priest. All right? But number, not only was he just a priest, he was a true man of God. He was righteous. He followed the scripture. Uh, again, they did not have the daily sacrifice at that time. They burned incense, but they weren't offering up sacrifices uh, like they had been 400 years earlier in the scriptures. That had been taken away. That privilege had been taken away from them, and it's still taken away today. They have not started that back yet. They, I, I told, told you a couple months ago, I believe it was, that they have, they have actually already picked the first high priest for the new temple. They have the garments, they have the heifer, they have everything they need to start back that daily sacrifice. The only thing they don't have is a temple. Why don't they have a temple? Huh? They're not allowed to build it on the site that it goes on. Why? Because it is under Muslim control and, and they actually own the ground and have a mosque built on the actual temple site. That mosque has got to come down before the temple can be rebuilt. And I want you to understand, that sounds like impossible, but it will happen. And it won't take long for it to come down and to be built up. I, in my mind, I can't help but think that somewhere they're hewing stones to build this temple. Because, uh, you know, the stones, nothing can be uh, uh, built actually there on site. According, if they're going to do it according to where the other one was built. And, and I kind of feel that they will. Everything was hewn out and brought there and set in place. It was built somewhere else. Uh, all right. Uh, but the angel said unto him, what, what was this angel's name, by the way? Gabriel. Gabriel. There's only three, three angels that are actually named in the whole scripture. Can anybody tell me who those three are? Gabriel and Michael. Who is the other one? Lucifer. We forget the fact that the devil, old Lucifer, Lucifer, was actually the exalted cherub of God, an angel of God. The scripture says he's able to transform himself into an angel of light. You know why? <laughs> he is. I mean, he... Uh, Again, it's believed that he actually led the worship of God and then desired it for himself. Scripture talk, talks about how beautiful, how anointed he was, but yet he fell. All right. So Gabriel comes to Zechariah and he says, Fear not. For thy prayer is her, thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. What makes this a miracle? Is it the angel coming? It's because, number one, she was, she was past the age of childbearing. It wasn't physically possible for them to have a child in man's eyes. There was just, I mean, even in Zachariah's eyes. Because did Zachariah believe this? Huh? Yes but, no. yes, but no. And probably more no than yes. Because of his unbelief. And again, that, that's not covered here in our scripture. But Zachariah couldn't speak for 10 months. How long does it take to have a baby, by the way? Ten. Now, honestly, 40 weeks. You go count it up, that's ten months. We 
talk about the ninth month, but in that, at the end of that ninth month, that's when the child's born. All right? That's why it's called 10, ten months. Because, you know, nine months, that's 36 weeks, right? Four nines is 36. I don't care where you went to school at. Even in Dave Day John's math, that's 36, right, Dave? <laughs> he may have to take his shoes and his toes off and count on fingers and toes twice somewhere, but he'll get there. I know I do. <laughs> All right. Thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. Why are they going to have joy and gladness? This is an answer to prayer, folks. I mean, this is something they thought that would never, ever happen. Again, there's no earthly way now. She's past the age of childbearing. Think of all the years of hope that they had, that they kept hanging on, that they kept hanging on, they kept hanging on. Elizabeth says, you know, of course, you know, he's the husband, he knows. That, that curse the women talk about all the time, uh, you know, it's, it's, no, it's no longer there anymore. So, um, she cannot physically have a child. It takes God to do that. All right? Huh? Neither could, Neither could Sarah. And many shall rejoice at his birth. Why were the people going to rejoice then? Well, wait a minute, Gary. They're going to rejoice at his birth. There was a great celebration went on in the family members and the people that friends simply because this was a miracle from God. Now, uh, for he shall be great in the eyes, uh, great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Uh, Sixteen, and many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go forth before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers uh, to the children and to the disobedient, to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, uh, to get back to what Gary was talking about, we find that in verse 16 about him turning many children of the Israel shall be turned to the Lord. We know that when he was preaching in the wilderness that all of Israel came out to see him. Not just some. Scripture tells us that all Israel went out to see and to hear his message. The, there's three things that stands out in verse 15, I kind of jumped ahead just a little bit, but I wanted to catch that because of the statement that Gary had made. He was some, someone that people listened to. What made, him, what made him different was the message that he had for the world. Agreed? Prepare. The high priest office at this time was a politically bought office. I mean, th think about it. The person that's high priest really has no right in being there. I mean, according to history and according to the scriptures, because what are they doing for the people? What is, what, all right, if you have it, I am the priest of this church. What is, what is my job for you? To point you or to lead you in the worship of God. True? Yeah. Alright, so if these priests, the, and especially the high priest, and the members of the Sanhedrin, they're not doing their job. If you, you go back and you study, again, 1 Kings and 2 Kings and Judges, and when the priest walked right before God, the people walked right before God. 
But when the people, when the priests strayed away and, and didn't, you know, and didn't take a stand, such as Eli. Now Eli walked before God. But the problem with Eli was is Eli turned a blind eye to his son's sin. I mean, his sons would stand at the door of the temple and when the people would bring the sacrifice in, they would say, give it to me now. It's mine. It belongs to me. And if they didn't give it to them, they'd take it. Not only would they take it, they slept with anything that had two legs. I mean, that's just a fact. Religion seeks to fulfill the lust and the desires of mankind. Salvation delivers us from those things. Because those things, because the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, which is what religion brings and satisfies, brings death and separation. So John's message was different in the fact he says, repent. As a matter of fact, when the priest come out, what did he call the priest when they came out to see him? Anybody remember? Oh, ye generation of vipers, flee from the wrath. That's what he, I mean, when the high priest is standing and listening to him preach, he called them snakes. You bunch of long life, <coughs> belly crawling creatures, what are you doing out here? You're destroying the nation. All right, he shall be great in the sight of everybody. Is that what that says? Great in the sight of the Lord. Why would God look upon John any different than you and I? What makes John great? You're not full of the Holy Ghost today? I mean, the Holy Spirit indwells you just like he did John. What makes John different in the eyes of God? Because he was the only... What excited God about this is finally it is time to send the one that says, hey, there's corn coming after me whose shoe latches I'm not worthy to and loose. Because if John doesn't come, guess what? Christ doesn't either. Then, right. Right, to prepare the way of the Lord. And that's actually mentioned down there in verse 17. So what excites God about John is the fact that, guess what? The Messiah comes right behind him. Malachi is the first. In the last, last, last book of prophecy, he's the one that said that there would be a, a light of the forerunner. Right. Right. This, this is the spirit of when, when John was asked the question, are you the one? Are you, and then again they asked him, are you the one that should come? His answer was no. Are you Elias? Are you some great prophet? His answer is always no. He says, but I'm the one of the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Had they knew the word of God, Then it said, what do we read that at? And they would have believed on John and on John's message. Listen, they rejected John. I realize that many of the common people repented and turned to God during this. If it wasn't for John, guess what? Two, the first two his disciples of Christ were John's disciples. John's followers. So he's great in the sight of the Lord because he is the forerunner. He's separated by God that he'll neither drink wine nor strong drink. All right? Separated. Sanctified. He's a chosen vessel. In other words, keep, it, keep him clean. Number three, he is filled with the Holy Ghost even from the mother's womb. Guess what? You can't say that about the Messiah. When did the Holy Ghost come upon Jesus? At 
when he was baptized at the age of 30. Now, I realize he was God all along, okay? I realize that. But John was separated for a purpose to be that voice, sanctified, set apart, filled with the Holy Spirit, to be the voice. To, and everything that John did was just point to Christ. You know what we need in our church today? We need some Johns that are full of the Holy Ghost, that are ready, and listen, that are not backward and that are ready to stand and to, to voice the voice of God. You know, when we come in here and we give a testimony, it ought to be an uplifting experience. It shouldn't be something that, that drags people down. I realize we share needs, we share a prayer request. I mean, Brother Charlie, he broke my heart earlier when he told me that his, his test came back positive, that there's something there. Our prayer is, God, take care of it. Right? I'm going to tell you something, folks. That's why Jesus went to the whipping post. Now, Charlie will get healing. It's just a matter of how God chooses to heal him. Amen? Whether he chooses to heal him physically here and extend his life out, or whether he ultimately heals him and takes him home where he'll never suffer no more. That's a healing. That's a, you know, because I'm going to tell you something. People that get sick, guess what? 99 out of 99 die. Even though they've been healed before. Hezekiah was healed of his disease. Guess what? Hezekiah slept with these fathers. I just read that, you know. And they buried him. The ultimate healing is to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Our desire is to stay here as long as we can. Amen. There are days we get homesick. It comes right down to it. Lord, can, I just, can you just let me stay here? <laughs> right? Back to Adam and Eve, the we have to face Amen. Amen. All right. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Again, all of Israel went out to hear John and were baptized at his preaching. This just kind of shows you that baptizing don't save you. Right. And it didn't. Still had to, even though they repented, and was... here's the thing: is they at that point when they come to get baptized, is what they did is they repented of their sin and began to seek the Lord. Okay, we have to again remember that for so long the children of Israel had been pointed in the wrong direction, and no one had begun to say, "Hey, you know, it's time we turn back to God." And I think that's a part of what's happened in our country today is for a long time, I mean, again, you had all these preachers that were just tickling people's ears and good motivational speakers that didn't have any anointing on, on their lives to preach and they're still out there. But there are people that are sick and tired of some of the things and, and realize, hey, if we don't turn to God, judgment's coming. Judgment. All right. And he shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elias. What does this mean? In the spirit and the power of Elias or Elijah. When Elisha was prophet, remember how far the nation of Israel had sunk into idolatry? And he just simply looked at him and said, how long halt ye between two opinions? He went on Mount Carmel and, and he called on God and the Holy Ghost fire came down. You say what you want. That was a Holy Ghost fire that came down that day, consumed the water, the sacrifice, the altar, every aspect of wood. I mean, a, a sacrifice that looked like it was inhumanly impossible to set on fire 
I mean, it's soaking wet. It ain't going to burn. It's just, again, there's no earthly way that sacrifice should have burnt. But God consumed it all in an instant. And what he was saying here, and the people's hearts, but you know, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is holy. And that's what, John, that's what he is. He's in that fire. He is that fire that is saying, hey, how long halt ye between two opinions? Repent and turn to God. That was the message. It's time to seek the face of the Lord. Uh, someone read verse 68, 69, 70, and 71. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up the horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. N number one, who, who's speaking here? This is Zechariah, okay? He's praising God when? After the birth. Zechariah again, for the whole time that she was pregnant, actually from the day that the angel was there, we don't know exactly what time that, the, that she actually conceived, but I, it had to be soon. You know, the thing about this priest, I mean, he, they didn't serve for a year at a time. They served a month at a time. But they served the same month every year for, from the time they were uh, 20 to the time they were 50, if my memory serves me correct. Uh, for the, a 30-year period, they would had the same month they had to come up. And, and that was job, their job, to make sure that the lamp didn't go out and to make sure that the incense was offered up. So Zacharias, uh, during this time, you know, the child is born, he can't speak. Some way he has conveyed to Elizabeth the vision that he saw of the angel. How he conveys it, we don't know because he can't speak. The writer of our lesson today implies that he could not even hear during that time. I don't know that the angel said that, said, you, you know, you'll be dumb and not be able to speak. I think, my opinion is, I think he could hear, he just couldn't speak. That's my opinion. All right? She, the baby's born, they come up and they, uh, on the eighth day to circumcise and actually to name the child. The child wasn't named until the eighth day. And when they circumcised, they name him. You know, they wanted to name him Zachariah. All the other priests, I mean, they're happy, they're elated for them. They want to call him Zachariah. And Elizabeth said, there's no way this child's name is going to be called John. You don't have anybody in your family by the name of John. Zachariah, they motioned to Zachariah and said, you know, she wants to call him John. What are we going to call him? And he wrote on a tablet, his name shall be called John. And when he did that, he was loose and he began to, and then this is, this is his praise to God. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel for he hath visited and redeemed his people. Now how has he redeemed his people here? Christ hasn't come yet. Huh? Huh? This is an eight year eight day old baby. How is how is it that Christ is or, or, or that the nation has been redeemed? Because Christ is coming because of the uh, Here, here's how. Elizabeth has a cousin. Anybody know her cousin's name? Mary. And Mary came where? To Elizabeth's house. And when she said, Hey! I'm here, John the Baptist being six months in her pregnancy, he leaped in the womb. So they know that the virgin has conceived, folks. They know redemption's on its way. So not only are they excited because God has heard and answered their prayer for the Son, but God, they're excited because God has heard and answered their prayer for the nation. 
Not only, you know, you and I get excited about this because God did not just redeem His people, Israel. He redeemed you and I. Whosoever will. The, the, all that call upon the name of the Lord. The Gentiles, every, all human race at this point in time is redeemed. Every soul from Adam until the last man is actually redeemed. Some accept it, some reject it. Christ, let me tell you something, you can't take, the, take, take part of the Scripture and not take it all because Christ died for the sin of the whole world. Did He not? So, they're excited. John, he's, he's excited because He is redeemed. Uh, notice the word visited. What does it mean here when it says that He has visited Visit there doesn't mean like what we actually, when we talk about visit, I mean when we go out, uh, we, we go to someone's, what it means is, is he's looked upon. He's turned toward the people. He's, he saw their needs. Okay? And hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Is he speaking of John here? No. no. Again, Zechariah knows something that the people around him doesn't know, that Mary is with child and it is... I mean, because listen, when Mary, Gabriel goes to Mary and begins to speak to her, Mary is informed that he shall save his people from, his sin, from their sins. This is the Savior. This is the Messiah. This is the Christ. This is the anointed one. Whatever you, words you want to use, Mary has told this and she has shared this with him. And again, I don't think, uh, uh, contrary to what the writer of our lesson wrote, I don't think that Zachariah was deaf and could not hear. I think he was just dumb and could not speak. Okay. For he hath raised up, uh, that's, that's speaking of Christ, a horn of salvation. John the Baptist, again, he said, John, are you the one? He said, I'm not him. But he's out there. And he's coming. And he comes and gets baptized of John. And John said, wait a minute, I need to be baptized of you, John. He said, John, we're going to fulfill the righteousness here. The next day he sees Jesus walking down the river bank over there. And he said, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Now John kept saying, boys, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And now John's standing there. I mean, he's preaching to his disciples that he's coming. And Jesus is standing there going down the riverbank. He looks over his boat and says, that's him. And Andrew and uh, John leave John the Baptist in the river of Jordan and begin to follow Jesus. And they come to him. We covered it uh, not long ago there. And he, he said, Master, and he said, come on. I mean, they just walk up and call him Master. Why would they do that? Because they believe the message of John. John Jesus, hadn't, Jesus hadn't fed anybody yet. I mean, think about this. He hadn't fed 5,000. He hadn't raised anybody from dead. He hadn't done anything. But yet they came to him and they call him Master. And then all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> Andrew finds Philip. Philip, we found him. Philip finds Nathaniel. Philip and Nathaniel, we found him. You know how people come to Christ? You and I are telling, him, telling them about him. All right? As he spake by the mouth of the holy prophets, which had been since the world began. I mean, for 4,000 years they're preaching that the Messiah is coming. And now all of a sudden, here he comes that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. Now, this is the part where I think Zechariah is still blind. Did he come to set them free from Rome? Did he come to set them free from the Philistines or any of the nations around that, 
that, I mean, the Assyrians or uh, the Egyptians, them that hate Israel, he didn't come to set them free. He didn't come to set the Jews free from, not, from uh, uh, Hitler. He came to set all that would free from the curse of sin. If you have been to this order and you have been born again, you are free. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Them that are still under the curse of sin and death, or Scripture calls it the curse of the law, because there, where there is no law, sin is not imputed. Or, in other words, it's not applied to. But, but we are law under ourselves, and I realize all that thing, but He came to save, not to set them free from them that hate them, and from their enemies round about. Again, this is, I think, partly we could see that the nation of Israel was blinded because they thought the Messiah would come riding in on the, uh, on the colt, the fold of an ass, and he would set them, I mean, Rome, you're out of here. Caesar, we're done with you. And that's what they prayed for there, by the way. You know what they were looking for? They weren't looking for a Savior to come to go to the cross. They was looking for a Savior to come and go to the throne. And they were sorely oppressed by Rome at that time, folks. All right. Someone read the next four verses. Notice again, this is a continuation. And again, it is a promise to the nation of Israel, but that Jesus, again, didn't come. He came to His own, all right? But His own received Him not. To perform the mercy promise of our fathers to remember His holy covenant. What was the promise? If my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves, seek my face, and pray, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I heal, hear their prayer, and heal their land. That's the promise. That's the promise. We use it today for uh, revivals and whatever, but that's the promise of the nation of Israel, to bring healing, to bring restoration, to they would be a people again, a nation a nation, by the way, under God. Under His protection. Under His provision. I will tell you something. There's no nation that, is, that, is, uh, that can stand without the protection and the provision of God. I mean, you think about it. What, look how we are blessed today. Why is it that we're blessed? Because we're a nation under God. And I realize a lot have tried to change that, but we still are. Yes, we, are. we still are. One nation under God. I realize that there's a bunch of among us that, that hate God and all these different things. And, and uh, Verse 73, The oath which he swore unto our father Abraham. What oath was it? that out of his loins would come forth a deliverer, a king. Who was that deliverer and that king? Jesus. That he would grant unto us that we would be delivered out of the hand of our enemies and might serve him without fear. When is 74 going to be fulfilled? Because it hasn't been yet. They have enemies all around them. Again, the nation is there now. Again, it took uh, 2,000 years almost after, 1948 years later, after Zechariah saying this, they finally became a nation, a people again. But listen, everybody around them hates them. Now they're talking about to be delivered out of the hand of their enemies and serve God without fear. They cannot do that now. When is this going to happen? In the 1,000-year millennial reign. When Christ is ruling and reigning, 
Uh, and, and David, by the way, is back to reigning on the throne of Jerusalem. In holiness and in righteousness before Him all the days of our, of our life. A, a child during the millennial shall die being a hundred years old. That'll be a, a hundred will be a young life. Look what we've got now. All right? In holiness and in righteousness before Him all the days of their life. That's how long that they want to fear Him. Or, or live without fear in front of their enemies. And I think that you and I uh, will be privileged to that. Here's the blessing for you and I while all this is going on for the nation of Israel. Guess what we're at? Guess what we have? Now, I know some of you think you have a glorified body now, but you don't. <laughs> but you will during that period of time. Right? I mean, we stand in front of the mirrors and... And look at all this. And look at all this. <laughs> they just don't realize how blessed they are, brother Johnny. Why is she looking at you like that for, Johnny? Why is she looking at you like that for? She's just in amazement still yet, ain't she? That's what it is. <laughs> All right, let's take a break and we'll come back for our worship here in a few minutes.